This camp was designed to give you the same exact experience as those minor league and major league players. A good example is Reggie and Guy and all of our instructors. On the first full day of camp, Dodgertown director Craig Callen and field activity supervisor Guy Wellman let the campers know what's in store for them for the coming week. Okay. Manager of Albuquerque, and this is his uh, first year at Albuquerque as the manager, so we thought it would be apropos to give him this club this year. Billy Russell. <laughs> you can hold on the applause. Preacher is his pitching coach. And Dino Evil. Where's Dino? All right. At uh, San Antonio, uh, the manager is Clem Labine. <laughs> Davey Lopes is his infield instructor, and John Shoemaker. <laughs> Bakersfield, Frank Howard is your manager. <laughs> Steve Yeager is his able assistant. <laughs> and Dave Wallace is his pitching coach. At Vero Beach is Wes Parker. Ralph Branca is his pitching coach. And John Devis. Now, we've got three guys that we've just cut loose and let them go wherever they want to go. They're going to be out there to help you. Uh, our roving pitching instructor, Carl Erskine. Two roving hitting instructors, Reggie Smith and Duke Snyder. Now, I introduced him last night, but our, uh, our special guest in this uh, camp, who will be umpiring behind the plate today, Bruce, over in the stadium this afternoon. <laughs> At Dodgertown, the main emphasis is on teaching the game. It's nice to have people like Carl Erskine and Preacher Rowe to show you the finer points of the game. I found out I always use the same, I would use the same stride, same step. One foot, you can put my foot. Now, if you're wild in or out, move on the rubber the way you're wild. If I was wild outside, I'd move this way. Well, you say, oh, you're wrong. No, because you move here and then you use the same step, that broke the throw back, see? But you're wild the other side, just move over a little bit. But you use the same step at that. That's the only thing. Another thing, concentration is not, you should look at the, look at your strike zone. It's the only thing I think you missed. Looking and getting your mind, concentrating in your mind what you're seeing. Hell, if you can look and throw it, hell, you might be thinking about something else. See? You tell your mind, make your mind say, I'm going to do what my eyes tell me, and then you, that's it. Now, right. Cardi right. covered it real well. I, well, the other thing that I think, particularly young pitchers and uh, maybe inexperienced pitchers, you have a tendency to pitch to the batter. No, you got a catcher that you're working with. That's who you want to look at. You can't control. You can't control where the batter's going to be. In time, when you get so you're skilled enough, you can be influenced by what the batter does. But in the beginnings, young pitchers ought to pitch to their catcher. And, uh, and not you can't control the batter. So if you're always looking where the batter is and then trying to adjust your throw to where you think he's going to be, it, it's backwards. You pitch to the, to the catcher as though there's not even a batter in there. So I think with those things, we could start throwing a little bit. And uh, everybody throwing the same direction, will you? At one time or another, all the aspects of the game will be covered. Pitching, infield, outfield, and probably most important of all, the mental aspects of playing baseball. Don't ever get on this line. That's his. You the line? Never get on the line. Never. Because he has every right to run you and knock you over. He has every right. It's not interference or anything. Even before the ball gets there, he can knock you down. Yes. Okay. Yes, if you're standing right here, what's he supposed to do? Okay. Sure. Just knock you down. And you can run into a catcher. I thought that line, Wes, was to keep him out. Yeah, remember, remember the, remember the play in the 69? He can run right on this line. He just can't run here. This is illegal. Oh, okay. This is legal. He's running right down this line. Can he run there if he's not avoiding the throw? If the throw's coming from there, he can run him off. Perry. Perry. I mean, isn't this just... Oh, okay. No. In other words, if he's running in here, he doesn't get hit with a throw. That's not. You're right. You're right. I mean, you don't have to run here. You're right. No, the guy wants to knock you for a shit. 
He can do it if he wants to. But what was the play in the 69 series when J.C. Martin was running in this thing? What is this hit? J.C. Martin was hit, was, was hit by a throw here. Yeah. That was a while ago. And, and the play. And and a little bunt. He should never have called him out. He was, he he was not called out. That was the whole point. He was, oh, that's right. He umped up blew the call. He was not so running in here. So what's the thing here? You can't. You're supposed to run it outside it, right? J.C. Martin no, was running inside. Here. Right here. You run here. You run in it? Yes. Yeah. That's run right here. I mean, you're not supposed to be running way over here, way over there. Yeah, you're running. See, if, you're, if you're hitting here, then it's legal. Oh, Martin inside. If you're shortstop with single mason. All right. Here's another thing is never tag the top of this bag. Right. You get, you get stepped on. I wonder if you can spike your Achilles tendon. You do that, Doc. You better watch that. How you put it in a Do I? Here's how you... When well, you the guy's are slow. You're right-handed. When you set it for your throat, ground ball hit to short. Okay, you come over to the bag, put your foot here like this. And don't put this foot way out. Yeah. Stand straight up and down like this. Open. And wait for the throw. Okay. If you have a mound area that you're working within, uh, in practice, now that's small, but in practice, what we used to do is well, to listen to this yeah. because yeah. this is something as a catcher you can pick up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is, um, is, is now second base. Se I'm standing on the mound right. uh, here. Okay. Second base is directly behind. Right. Me, okay. If you if you started at the rubber and you drew a, a imaginary line or a, just draw one when you're practicing, you draw it right back off the back of the mound, or right directly toward I a bad line, right directly toward second base. Now you got to practice this because it doesn't come easy. What happens when most pitchers turn to throw to second? Their foot hits here and they throw here, and the ball oftentimes will go high and away. And you have no way to right. catch it. But the automatic way to get the ball down low and at the bag is to make sure that this leg, if you're right here in the picture, that this leg, when you turn, crosses this line. Look what that does to you. See what happens? Right. If you don't do that, you, you really lock up and blow in the heat of a ball game. And, and the other thing you got to do is throw that sucker hard. Don't lollipop a pick off the second leg. Why? Number one, if your team's really in the in knows what's going on, your center fielder is going to know the pickoff's on. He's not going to give it away by shortening up, but he's going to be ready. And if you turn and fire that ball, three things can happen. You'll either pick the guy off, you'll drill him in the back, or it'll go through to center field. All three ways you want to have something on it. <laughs> okay? So, that's the, that's the technique. Now, as far as timing, that has to be practiced with your shortstop, second baseman. I never had much success picking a guy off with a second baseman cover. I just, just never just never could quite do it. The, the, but the shortstop, and there's two or three techniques that they use, and I'm not sure how they teach uh, now in the We used to teach me able to do that. Daylight. Daylight. Daylight play. Daylight. 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 Play. We, we, Daylight. Yeah. Daylight we, go, huh? We used to have, and I'm sure Carl probably had it too, because it was thrown up to the system. Yeah. We had we had regular pickoff signs that would come to the catcher, right. that would relay them on right. the infield right. that came from the bench. Right. Well, and then the pitchers and the middle infield. Still have a couple. And then the, the pitchers and the infield would have a daylight play with the shortstop. But the, the important thing for a pitcher to remember is if your shortstop's going over there and you're, you're in here and you say, I don't think so, then you better step off. See, that's where a lot of times uh, young pitchers make mistakes is that they got their shortstop going a little bit like this, and, they might, yeah. and then all of a sudden they pitch, and there's a ground ball yeah. going there. Yeah. So that's where your pitcher, your pitcher, I mean, the catcher can do the same thing. The catcher can say, step off yeah. anything or call a timeout if your position, if your infielders are out of position. As a catcher, when are you going to give that, that signal to the to that shortstop? Well, a lot of times it would come with, it come from the manager, come from no. the bench. I mean, we had it before you called the pitch, or oh yeah, okay. oh yeah. I mean, we had we had four bunt plays, if I remember correctly, and the fourth one was the pickoff play at second base when a guy was on uh, first and second, and you, you know the hitter's going to be bunting the ball down the third base line. You want to get that that third baseman in, where the second baseman would go behind, or the shortstop would break in behind the base runner. Get him going back, and they would immediately break to third on, on bunt play three. All right, and everybody, of course, is coming in the second base because you leave second base unattended. All right, but play the pickoff play. We used to work it both ways, where the shortstop would go in, break towards the third baseman came in, and the second baseman came over, and then there was the old uh, the old pickoff play move that that the shortstop went in, 
for the second baseman, a catcher used to drop his glove or used to throw it up or used to open it. Any movement that the catcher made indicated for the pitcher to turn and fire. It was a timing play. Yeah. A lot of guys could use it, a lot of guys couldn't. But you got, there's a feel of that together and, and you get that pass in there just right. at the split second. Well, you work with a guy. A lot of pitchers are very reluctant. That's the first problem with working on pickoffs in second. They don't like to do it. A lot of pitchers don't like to even throw to first. And why is it that left-handers don't like to throw to first? <laughs> left-handers yeah. left looking right at him. And he, they, sometimes guys won't throw. You gotta get past that. So with young pitchers, good time to start. That that is a valuable tool for a pitcher to have. I, I want some games pick the guy on second in a critical time. That's when you do it. Three and two and a base is loaded. Everybody's gearing up to go, you know, and you gotta get the ball over. Put that play on, you nail a guy back here that's sound asleep. That's all you need. And uh, things that used to get me, I think probably agree. Is that pitcher on the mound that, that's out there and the pitcher is in control of the situation? All right, versus the guy that give me the ball, let me throw. Give me the ball, let me throw, because he's out of control. But you take the pitcher that can come here like this. Now, the infielders know him. They've worked together. They've worked on this, and they know. It's it's just the timing. But you get the guy, the old vet out there that sits here and he looks this way and looks again. He holds the ball. He might just stare at you. And I have found, as a catcher, that the first time that pitcher holds that ball and stares at that base runner, that base runner starts to either tip his way where he's going, all right? Just by holding the ball. Right. Get back on the field. Yeah, Just, yeah, he's, he, he's going to go. He's going to go like this, and all of a sudden, he's going back. He's leaning, and I said, uh-oh, excuse me, baby. Here comes the automatic pitch out right here, baby. Bingo, bingo. Here he goes. I'm already out of the batter's box. I'm already out of catcher's box. My pitcher's new. Whatever pitch was called, it's now a pitch out. It's great to be able to have someone like Dodger Hall of Famer Duke Snyder check out your batting style and give you a few tips on hitting. My name is Herb Lewis. I'm from Pacific Palisades, California. This is my fourth year, thanks to my wife, who started it four years ago for every anniversary. I'm the oldest in camp. I'm 77, and I can't help realizing that I have two very good friends here, Richard Abrams, who's 72, Sam Neese, who's 72. I'm 77, and if you figure it out, that's 221 years of baseball and our love for the Dodgers. Thank you. I'm uh, Richard Abrams. I'm from San Bernardino, California, and Palm Desert, California. And, uh, of course, I've been a Dodger fan. I used to live and die as a kid. It's amazing that I'm here. But uh, through, the, through my lovely wife, uh, Betty, uh, and uh, my good friend, Herb, uh, I'm here and I'm enjoying it. It's great to be here. It's great to be anywhere at this stage of my life. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amador Gonzalez. This is my fourth camp. I'd say hello to my wife, Irene, my kids, Laura, Rebecca, Marco, and Maurice. I uh, hope one of these years I can bring my boy with me if I can still run after this year and swim because of all the rain. See you next year. Hi, I'm Richard Miller. It's my second camp. I just want to say hi to Liz and Angela and everybody else back home. I'm having a great time. Uh, I miss you guys, and uh, I'll be back here again, I don't know when, but many times. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Nesvig from Olatana, Minnesota. I've been a Dodger fan since 1951. I'd just like to thank Diane for this week. Uh, my name is Guy Wellman. This is my 19th camp. I've really become a veteran here. My wife, I gotta say thank you to my wife, Fern. She sends me here every year, and I really love that gal and appreciate what she's done for me. Thank you, what a great time I've had. Hi, I'm Bill Russell. I've been at the camp here for three or four years, eating a little bit. I'm in good shape now and think I can make it in the big leagues. Hi, I'm Dickie Vaughn. I'm from Dallas. This is my eighth camp. The weather's beautiful. I'm enjoying it as usual. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi, Mark Acaba from Upland, California. Glad to be here. Hopefully my body will hold up for the whole week. Say hi to the folks at home. I'm here with uh, King Kong Bundy. We're having a great week. The only thing about it is he's been carrying me all week. And he's getting heavy. After the instructors have a chance to evaluate the campers, it's time for the all-important draft session. 
It's time to try and get lucky as they study their charts, scratch their heads, and try to pick a winning combination. As one of the campers said of Dodger trainer Bill Bueller's exercise program, if you're going to play, you've got to pay. So they're out there every morning moaning and groaning, and sometimes it really does hurt so good. Hurt so good. Bill Schuper from La Cunada, California, and I just want to say hi to my wife Judy and my son Matt and Nicholas. Hi, I want to say hi to my family back in Southern California. Mark, where'd you go with I'm Michelle, Jilly, Joshua, and Jason. Jason, I'm down here scouting out the uh, camp for you. I know you'll be here in about 10 or 15 years. Hi guys, Dave, Danielle, Aaron, having a great time down here. Ava, thanks for a great 40th birthday present. Really enjoy it. Nice fantasy. Thank you. I'm Sandy Kriegler from Sherman Oaks, California. This is my fourth Dodger camp. I'll say hi to my wife, Shelly, and my boys, Brian and Gregory. Hello, I'm Paul Von Berg, Newport Beach, California. This is my fourth camp. Say hello to my wife, Stacy, my son, Zachary, and my lovely daughter, Megan, whose birthday is coming up on Sunday. I'll see you then, princess. Bye. Wait a minute, Paul. Whoops. Who on this camera caught a doubleheader? Uh, it must be me. I must have caught a doubleheader yesterday. Hi, I'm Ron Lee from Long Beach, California. I'd like to spe say a special thanks to Jamie, my wonderful wife that sent me here, and hi to Justin and Jeremy. John Nee, nice, South Pasadena, California. This is my fourth camp. Sun came out, and uh, finally getting some good weather to play, too. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dick Cook from La Cunada, California. Uh, it's a great day. Uh, glad to be here. The way I feel, I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> I'm Sam Nee from Palm Desert, California. Glad to be here meeting all the uh, veterans, and I'm a veteran. I'll say that I'm here with my son, John. I'm Dave Hittner from Houston, Texas. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn on the glory days of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and it's just great to be here. If you like getting crazy, you'll love the games that take place in the Camp Grapefruit League Championship Series. It's a six-game fight to the finish as the campers lay it all out on the line. Mm-hmm. 
Copycat. I'm Joe Grancelli from Fort Pierce, Florida. I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, my wife, Margie, urged me to join this camp, and I love it here. I'm glad I'm here. Tell them about your catching. Well, I've, I haven't caught a game in about 37 years, but I, I've picked it up a bit, quite a bit. Heck Feels of a good. Job. <laughs> Heck of a job. That's it? Thank you. Wayne Canaster, South Orange, New Jersey. Hi, Jill, Dane, and Devin. Having a great time again. Uh, no injuries this year. Shoulders okay. Except I'm not playing very well, so I'm going to have to wait for Dan, who's taking this picture right now, to make me sound a lot better than I really am, and I'm counting on him. See you soon. I'm Bill Grayley from West Virginia. That's my second trip down here, and I'm having a great time. I'm not as sore as I was last year, so I'm enjoying it more this year. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan Shackman. Glad to be back here for my sixth time. Weather's nice. Food's great. Friends are all back again. Can't wait till next year. Hi, I'm uh, Ed Waller. I'm an attorney from Tampa. Sort of wonderful to be here. Uh, my firm defends accident cases, and all these people are here in pain, and they got nobody to blame but themselves. Thanks. Okay, this is Bob Hansen and Kurt Hansen, and we're a father and son team, and uh, we're having a great time down here. This is my, let's see, I don't know how many times I've been here, but since '86. Uh, I'm uh, still just a rookie here, first year. And we want to say hello to our various families back in uh, Huntington Beach in Southern California. Say hi to Lynn. And uh, Brianna and Nick and Brenda and thank them for letting us spend the week out here. Yeah, we're having a great time. It's wonderful to be here with us, my uh, son. Couldn't be any better. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Phil Snyderman from Encino, California. It's my rookie season down here. And, uh, Having a wonderful time. I'm on a first name basis with the trainer, wrapped from toe right to the head, but loving every minute of it. And Shaw, thanks for a wonderful anniversary present. Hi, I'm Bob Kallenbaugh from beautiful Lake Forest, California. Happy to be here uh, celebrating uh, 40 years on the planet. Feel like I'm 20. Uh, I'd like to say hi to Kevin, Brian, Michael, and Chris, and you three guys. About 20 years from now, I want you guys to bring me back down here, and we'll be out here all together. See you later. John, Junior Marquis, South Yarmouth, Cape Cod. Been down here many times over the years. I've been away for a couple of years, and uh, it's great to be back in baseball heaven. I want to thank my wife, Mary Pat, my sons, Greg, Chris, and Paul, and my little son, Nathan, for putting up with me with all these camps and so forth. And I really love you all, and it's going to be in great shape when we get back and start getting that things up there in Cape Cod, and I hope someday one of the boys will be down here too. God bless you all. Have a great year. Junior, did you miss us? Every pitch. I, huh? <laughs> Say what? what? Every did did, did, did miss I miss you? I sure as hell did. Yeah, I missed everybody. It's a tough place to be away from. Thank God I got a few calls from a few people now and then to say, hey, when are you coming down? And uh, my time's running out, but I did miss everybody a lot, and I love the place. And uh, when it comes to baseball and fun and camaraderie, this is this is it. Thanks. Missed you too, Dan. Well, here I am in Dodger Town again. Uh, after the monsoons here a couple days ago, we got some decent weather, and we're gonna have a great game day. We got a doubleheader going on. Had one yesterday to make up for Monday, and I'd like to say hello to Gail and uh, Brad McKenna. I miss yes. you guys, but uh, we're going to have a great uh, time looking at this movie when we get back. And I just wanted uh, to look forward to seeing you when I get home. Okay, this is David Crump. Everything's okay. Doesn't matter. Everything's okay. We'll make the other team pay for it. It's all right. It's long been a Dodger tradition to recognize good play in the field by awarding a Mr. Potato Head to that day's hero. It may be ugly to most, but it's beautiful to the guy that gets to take one home. Our, our hero of the game, who's, whose name has already been mentioned, uh, played shortstop for us. He had a couple of hits. He made, I think, the turning point in the game play with the bases loaded and one out, and he went behind second and backhanded a ball for a force out at second that, that took Frank's, Frank's team out of a big inning and saved the game for us, and that player is Mark Goldstein. <laughs> The guy who's getting our potato head award is not somebody who I'm going to stand up here and say he went three for three and hit grand slam home runs and did this and that and such and so. 
but a guy who who did very well in the outfield, who ran the bases perfectly, I thought, today, in spite of one time when I was waving him over and he held up, and he would have been thrown out at third, so he made me look good, even though I was waving him over, and led off the bottom of the seventh inning. We're down by three runs. We need that first guy on base, and he, he hit a 3-1 pitch and just lined that ball into left field, just kind of served it out there in the left field without trying to pull it. He didn't get over anxious, and it was just something about that I thought this guy's got to get the Potato Head Award, and that is Barry Scripps. Anybody that can take a jolt from Sal, the human torpedo LaRocca, and still survive has got to get that award. Where's Joe Brancelli? Come on, Joe. What we did, we got seven strong innings out of a guy that's a heck of a hitter and a heck of a ball player, but he hadn't pitched that much. But John Nisi, come on up and get the Potato Head Award. Thank you so much. Another Dodger Town tradition is the Western Barbecue Night. <laughs> Look at that, some Kansas Cowboys. Look at that. Yeah. Too small. That's it. That's it? tonight, he got two singles, two RBIs, and scored a run, Richard Miller. Thank you, Rich. How's it going? Good morning. I don't know who that award goes to Ron Leaf, who had two long doubles to left, plus a base hit for a three for four afternoon. special guys, a man who started one rally today, scored our first run, kept us going in another big inning, he singled in a run and then scored later, and he's a perennial good guy in his camp, Sal LaRocca. We're giving them one minute. No, not. I just want to say now that I finally won one of these, that I can go into the same corner that Pat Wood and David Pines are in, and I'll be there with them. <laughs> Our award goes to a guy called Mr. Hustle. He's always in the game. He's also the fourth coach, so he likes to believe he's number one. And he, he's caught every inning of every game we've played. He was two for two, but. He hit a bases loaded double that really got our rally going and got us over the top to really uh, put us out of reach, I guess, and that's Bart Kaufman. What does that say, Bart? Goofy. Goofy? Bobby and I'd be proud of him. It's also the night the instructors get to have the campers entertain them. Under the leadership of empresario Ralph Branca, the campers show that they have some talent too. We got a great drummer from the Midwest. We got a harmonica player. I'm not sure where uh, extra harmonica players from. I believe it's Pennsylvania. And then we have from deep in the heart of Texas, West Virginia. We have a West Virginia, a mountaineer from West Virginia plays harmonica. And then from deep in the heart of Texas, Mr. David Crump. He plays guitar, and this is the team called the Foregone Conclusions. Yeah. Yeah. 
do we have from Houston, West Virginia, Indiana, and from California, the foregone conclusions. And we'll just take a minute while they set up. <laughs> Are you ready, guys? Reggie. Reggie, go get him. Okay, David. The lead man, David Crump. Come on, we gotta have you guys do a repeat, even if you repeat what you just did. You guys gotta come on back. Take it, Reggie. Take a solo, Reggie. Sing it. Yeah, everybody sing along with this one. You are my sunshine. You all know the words. Even Seth knows the words. Everybody.
you know, we come down here and it's all uh, get ready and go. You don't have much time, so Reggie's doing great. We just roll these drums out, doing super. Anyway, um, years ago, there used to be a train that came down the eastern seaboard. It must have brought hundreds of ball players to Florida in spring training just to try to make it. Well, Reggie and I are going to catch that train. It's called the Orange Blossom Special. Oh, yeah. Town, Florida. your gun. We have a star of the show, Mr. Herb Lewis, and the great song is No Business Like Show Business. Mr. Herb Lewis. There's no business like show, business like no business I know. Everything about it is appealing, everything that traffic will allow. Where could you get that happy feeling when you are stealing that extra bar? There's no people like show, people they smile when they are low. Yesterday they told you you would not go far, that night you open and there you are. Next day on your dressing room they hung the star, let's go. The wrestlers, the tumblers, the clowns, the roustabouts that move the show at dawn. The music, the spotlights, the people, the towns, your baggage with the labels pasted on. The sawdust and the horses and the smell. The towel you've taken from the last hotel. There's no business like show, business like no business I know. You get word before the show has started That your favorite uncle died at dawn Top of that your ma and pa have parted You're broken hearted, but you go on There's no people like show People they don't run out of dawn Angels come from everywhere with lots of jack And when you lose it, there's no attack where could you get money that you don't give back? Let's go on with our show. The 
costumes, the scenery, the makeup, the props, the audience that lifts you when you're down. The headaches, the heartaches, the backaches, the flops, the sheriff who escorts you out of town. The opening when your heart beats like a drum. The closing when the customers won't come. There's no business like show, business like no business I know. Everything about it is appealing, everything the traffic will allow. Nowhere could you get that happy feeling when you are stealing that extra bow. There's no people like show, people they smile when they are low. Even with a turkey that you know will fall, you may be stranded out in the cold. Still you wouldn't change it for a sack to go. Let's go on with the show. Let's go on with the show. Hi, I'm Mike Orieff, and this is my first camp, and I'd like to thank my wife, Debbie, for sending me for my 40th birthday, and also say hello to Alex. Hi to Enid, Eric, Debbie, Jennifer, David. I was just hitting a few home runs. Uh, the Duke showed me how, and uh, old Carl Erskine showed me how to do a no-hitter with it. Hi, I'm Chris Fabus from Rancho Cucamonga, California. I'd like to say hello to my wife, Kathy, my son, Matthew, and my daughter, Heather. This is my second camp. I'm having a great time. Hi, I'm Andy McIntyre, Hidden, Hidden uh, Hi, I'm Andy McIntyre, Hidden Hills, California. I miss Carly and Tyler, and I wish you were here with me like we were last year with uh, uh, Leonard. And um, I hope you guys are doing well and doing your homework. I'll see you in a week. Hi, I'm Neil Adams from Reseda, California. I want to thank my lovely wife, Sue, for letting me come down here, uh, enjoying the week, rooming with uh, my buddy Henry Cook and having a good time. and seeing all the friends I've made over the years, and I can't wait to come back again. Hi, Steve Adler, Moline, Illinois. I've been here a lot. Uh, I'd like to use this uh, opportunity of my media exposure to urge Vern Krauss, the pelvic prince, come back. Hi, Sam Coyarini, my fifth camp. Thanks to Stella. And I'm here talking with Dan. I was always appreciating his great work. And uh, was here yesterday and saw 8.7 on the Richter scale when Bundy and LaRocca collided. What a happen. Thanks, and I'm looking forward to the next camp. My name is Mark Sigmund, first year. Had a hell of a time. Okay. LaRocca can't count, doesn't know his cards, and one thing is for sure, I'll always bring a body bag with me for Marty. Uh, Marty Perry from Hicksville, New York, and I'm down here basically to take care of Mark Sigmund, keep him out of trouble, and to teach Wes Parker how to play chess. Uh, Sal LaRocca, this is my eighth camp and uh, still great to come, and uh, hopefully I'll look for my ninth. Thank you. John Stahlberg, Santa Monica, California, third camp. Each camp gets better, a lot of fun, and as long as La Rocca keeps coming, I'll keep coming. Hi, Henry Cook from Dharan, Saudi Arabia. This is a special note of thanks to Bonnie for 33 years of understanding what makes me tick and why I have to come to ball camp, and also a special hi to Ann. At the November 1992 camp, the question on most everyone's mind was, what went wrong with the Major League Club? Listen to what some of the instructors thought might be the reasons. You can't explain why. Yeah, I, I sat back and watched this team, and it looked like expansion a year early. But the Dodgers made some, the front office made some bad decisions. Some of the players that they counted on got hurt. It's just not the same. Chemistry is not there. The tradition is not there because you have it come from within. And then when times get tough, uh, you see where they start running to. They just start blaming each other, and, and uh, they're worrying about making a mistake, and consequently they make a mistake. There's just no camaraderie there. And that's what I saw last year. And, and uh, unfortunately, it was a bad year. Uh, on the bright side of it, we'll get a number one draft pick next year. I guess we'll get number two. The American League will pick first, and at least the Dodgers will get a number two pick. I'm a real authority on um, what happened last year to the Dodgers because I saw them play twice, once in Cincinnati and once in L.A. I will say this. 
Uh, most people probably, uh, not close to pro baseball, at least in my day, <coughs> there was a real bad feeling when you lost. And if there was ever a motivation to win, is to fail to win. And uh, if that's still alive, Billy, I don't know if that's in the modern player, if it's still there, but I can't believe it's not. Um, there's something good about losing. Failure is a great motivator unless you just let it beat you down. And if you want to dissect the Dodgers and put them together and what happened today, I'll let you do it in your own minds. Because I certainly think that that has a great deal to do with it. So if you make your comments, and I don't mean to leave out the third baseman, first baseman, who, my God, rookie of the year, uh, or the left fielder, right fielder, but it's merely the fact that the strength of your club does belong directly in the middle. One, of course, because you've got to have a great catcher. You've got to have a good shortstop with great arm and be able to roam. And a center fielder who can help out the left fielder and the right fielder by being able to cover a little more territory. So uh, it certainly puts that into the context of what a good team is all about. And if there was a failure, you take the Dodgers and just look at it, and you see the failure, without a doubt. It, the pitching staff certainly wasn't that bad, one way or the other. You can't have 40-some-odd one-run ball games, whether it's seven to six or anything else. Maybe part of the staff in a bullpen would have, would have failed. There's no doubt about that, uh, with Howell being hurt and not being able to get a really good stopper. But certainly Butler, you can't fault. Uh, Scotia's getting a little older, but my God, he's still a great catcher, like it or not, even though he uses a mask once in a while to get the ball. <laughs> I don't know what I can add that hasn't already been said, but I think talking with Reggie and Reggie getting a new position, I think that what Reggie's going to do is something that, that needs to be done. It should have been done a long time ago. It never should have gotten away from, and that is back to basics. Back to basics, build within your organization, build from the minor leagues. Get the best quality instructors you can find. Pay them some more money so make sure that they, they do a good job. Teach the players how to play in a minor league, how to come up with the tradition, what togetherness means, what, what uh, it means to know how to play your position and not worry about anybody else's position. But if you do your job and everybody else does theirs, everybody's in the right place at the right time in any situation. I think that is something that really needs to be back, even from the way they wear their uniform. I'm sick and tired of seeing athletes with long pants with stirrups that the wives and girlfriends wear. I'm tired of seeing high top shoes. I mean, really, honest to God, I'm really tired. If you're not going to play like a big leaguer, then don't dress like something else. I mean, you know, dress, dress like you're going to, like you know what you're doing instead of the way some of these guys dress. But if you make $3 million, I guess you have a fashion statement to make. And to be truthful, I would rather see them retain their pitches and go with that and hope that you could win games like in in the glory days of the 1960s, where, you know, the, their offense was Maury Wills, who either hit a chop or walk, stole second and third, and scored on a, a ground ball. And of course, they had great pitching, and they uh, led by, uh, you know, Drysdale and Koufax, and of course, he had, uh, what's his name? Padres, and they had uh, Ose Glodostein, you know, Ogoma could pitch too. And, and they really had a good pitching staff and carried the club, and that's all part of defense. And I think that's where the Dodgers' shortcoming came, and uh, that they didn't have defense. And again, defense wins. You can hit a lot of home runs, but you better be able to catch the ball. 30, 35, 40 years ago, baseball had the market cornered on the quality athlete because it was the only game at that time that paid any money. The NBA was uh, almost a, um, a weekend league. The National Hockey League was unheard of. Uh, golf was just uh, there again, another weekend league, tennis. But what has happened with the advent of, let's say, Pete Rozelle's NFL, Larry O'Brien's NBA, Alan Nagelson's National Hockey League, Dean Bayman's professional golf uh, circuit, the PGA, uh, soccer is even there into it to a certain degree. What has happened, because they're paying top dollar today, we in baseball, no longer have the market cornered on the quality athlete. We're losing a lot of our quality athletes to other games. I did feel bad about the pitchers this year, because I was in the same shape as them one time. In Pittsburgh in 1947, Hank Greenberg had retired and they brought him out of retirement at first. Jimmy Bloodworth in retirement, they brought him out and played second. Jeep had his own third, he had a football knee. He tried to go to the right, his knee would pop out, and we'd have to take the trainer and go jerk it back. <laughs> and old Sands described your shortstop. 
<laughs> old Seth was down fishing one day, and old Seth brought his brother down there to go fishing. And in the lake, the bank was all say 12 feet down to the water. And his brother is 92. So Seth got his brother out of the car, and he loaded him up with about six rods and reels, a minnow bucket full of minnows on either end, on either arm. He hung that on his head, take him down to the boat. So brother started down, and he got overbalanced. He got to going faster and faster, and he wound up right on his belly in that boat, broke all his rods, and the men are flopping. And Seth simply said, brother comes up good, but he don't go down worth the damn. <laughs> I'll tell you two things that, that disturbed me about, about the direction the team was going in. About three years ago, I listened to a Dodger ball game and realized as, as the, the lineup was being announced by Vince Scully that not one of the starting nine players came through the Dodger farm system, not one. We were starting nine different guys from nine different organizations. And then I think it was in late August or early September, we played a game that I heard on the radio and the Dodgers made their seventh error with one out in the seventh inning, and for the rest of the game, for the, the last eight outs, the fans in Dodger Stadium were rooting for error number eight because that would be a new Dodger record. Now that, that's the low point as far as I'm concerned, when your own fans are rooting for you to, to boot a ball in the last part of the game to set a, a new error record uh, for a Dodger ball club. And, and I, I have always believed, and, and I know that the Brooklyn guys carried this tradition to LA and it was passed along to me by Drysdale and Koufax and Wally Moon and just the, the great guys that, that made this tradition that we have. We've talked about it in the past about Dodger pride, Dodger chemistry, and you can't have that, ladies and gentlemen. You can't, you can't just put a Dodger uniform on a guy who came from the New York Mets or a guy who came from the Cincinnati Reds and all of a sudden call him a Dodger. It just doesn't work that way. You don't become a Dodger just because you suddenly put on a uniform. You, you have to grow up with this stuff. You have to have it embedded and instilled in you through the farm system. You have to get it from the guys who are surrounding you who should also have been uh, former Dodgers. Because a guy from the Mets and a guy from Cincinnati isn't going to teach a guy from Oakland how to be a Dodger. It's obvious that there were players that had some bad years. And I think Ray Charles and Jose Feliciano can see that. <laughs> As to why they had the years that they did and what went wrong. And that's what happens when you start to lose. You start looking for reasons why you lost. And that's something that you have to deal with. Uh, when you've been so used to winning and having the tradition, the long tradition that the Dodgers have had of winning, Yes, there has been a disruption, an interruption of the flow of talent coming through the minor league system. And something needed to be done about it, and something is being done about it. A lot of people have to take blame from the scouting department to the front office. Maybe we did become a little bit complacent and what's happened, but again, I repeat, something is being done about it. Something new was added for the November 1992 camp as National League umpire Bruce Freming was invited to participate. Right from the start, Bruce proved to be very entertaining. Uh, when you start out umpiring, you're told you're in charge of the ballpark. And I was a 19-year-old kid, and I never forgot that coming out of school, that they said the park is yours. And I went into Duluth one night, and there was a guy hollering at my partner who was working uh, behind the plate and hollering, hollering, hollering. And he was from the press box. So I went into Jack and I said, Jack, uh, that guy's really on you. I said, uh, you know, you can run him out of the press box. Well, Jack didn't want any part of that. And the next night I was behind the plate and the guy in Duluth, Minnesota, he just kept hollering at me and I finally called time. And I said, clear the press box. Well, that isn't done a whole lot in sports, you understand? <laughs> and uh, you're dealing with the press, and uh, nobody moved, of course. Being 19 years old, everybody just sat there, and they thought, well, the guy's crazy. So my partner came in, he said, what happened? I said, Jack, I've just cleared the press box. He said, you got to be kidding. 
And I said, no, and I said, they got 10 minutes. I don't know why I gave him 10 minutes. I think I was buying time. <laughs> and uh, nobody moved for five minutes. Finally, the uh, uh, president of the ball club, Mr. Nicholson, came down on the field, and he said, Bruce, we've got 1,400 people here, and it's only the fourth inning. We'd have to give their money back if you forfeit the game. I said, that's exactly what you'll have to do then. So he finally pleaded with them to leave the press box. They picked up their typewriters. They had to shut off the scoreboard. And uh, the press box was shut. I cleared the press box. Well, needless to say, after the game in Duluth, we had police protection back to our hotel. We were staying at the Alexandria Hotel. And police got us back to the hotel and everything. And we went downtown, kind of like a back alleyway. I was working with an older guy. And I just started drinking beer at the time. We went to this bowling alley, and we had a couple beers, and I wanted to go home and call my new bride at the time, Rosemary. We had just gotten married. I wanted to tell her what an exciting evening I had. And as I'm walking up this hill in Duluth, there's two guys following me. And uh, I looked behind, and I thought, well, I'll just pick up the pace a little bit. And as I picked up the pace, they picked up the pace. And finally, I did something probably, you know, once in a while, an umpire makes a mistake. I took this alley. It was a dead-end alley. It was a produce alley. And these two guys came down the alley after me. And I thought I really was in trouble. And my dad always said, hit the biggest guy and then run like hell. So I took a swing at this real big guy. He picked me up like a toothpick. He was about as big as Frank Howard. And he said, Bruce, we're the Duluth police. We're just making sure you get back to the hotel. <laughs> Before you know it, it's the last day of camp and time for the big game between the campers and the instructors. As you'll see, we had a little trouble getting this one started, but what there was of it was really good. The San Antonio team, which ended its series with a 5 and 1 record, they were managed by Clem Levine and coached by Davy Lopes and John Shoemaker. First from Moline, Illinois, number 41, Stephen Adler. Osterville, Massachusetts, number 4, Walter Benson. From Saudi Arabia, number 14, Henry Cook. From Rancho Cucamonga, California, number 32, Chris Fapos. From Long Beach, California, number 32, Ron Lee. From Arcadia, California, number 32, Jim Leahy. From South Yarmouth, Massachusetts, number one, Junior Marquise. From La Canada, California, number seven, Roger Merrim. From Awatonna, Minnesota, number 14, Tom Nesvick. From my knives, California, number 30, Michael Ory. From Cortland, Ohio, number seven, Vern Parker. From La Canada, California, number 32, Bill Shepherd. From Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, number 32, Mark Sigmund. And from Atlanta, Georgia, number 77, Russ Uppenauer. 
And that's the San Antonio Camp team. Now introducing the team that finished second with a 4-2 record managed by Wes Parker, coached by Ralph Frank and John Davis, the Vero Beach team. Introducing from South Orange, New Jersey, number two, Wayne Canastra. From Houston, Texas, number 16, David Crump. From West Palm Beach, Florida, number 32, Mark Goldstein. From Huntington Beach, California, number seven, Bob Hansen. Okay. From Huntington Beach, California, number 11, Kurt Hansen. From Houston, Texas, number 10, David Hitner. From Sydney Valley, California, number 29, Larry Kahn. From Indianapolis, Indiana, number 14, Barton Kaufman. From Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, number four, Sal LaRocca. From Garden Grove, California, number 22, Bert Levy. From Laramie, Wyoming, number 16, Richard Marston. From Hidden Hills, California, number four, Andy McIntyre. And from Encantinas, California, number 17, Barry Scripps. That's the Vero Beach team. Team that finished third with a 2-4 record, the Albuquerque team, managed by Bill Russell, coached by Preacher Rowe and Dino Evil. From Reseda, California, number 14, Neil Adams. From Upland, California, number 30, Mark Akaba. From Carroll, Indiana, number eight, Marv Bittinger. From La Canada, California, number 23, Dick Cook. From Yorba Linda, California, number 33, Amador Gonzalez, Jr. Hey, hey, hey. From St. Albans, West Virginia, number 8, Bill Grayley. Hey, hey, hey. From Pacific Palisades, California, number 12, Herb Lewis. From Los Angeles, California, number 29, Richard Miller. From Brooklyn, New York, number seven, Sam Quaglarini. Hi, boy, Sam. From Livingston, New Jersey, number seven, Ellen Schachman. From Tampa, Florida, number 19, Ed Waller. Okay, Ed, good job. From Long Beach, California, number 24, Howard Weiss. And from Dallas, Texas, number one, Dennis Wells. And that's the Albuquerque team. Now introducing the Bakersfield team, which finished with a one and five record, managed by Frank Howard, coached by Steve Yeager and Dave Wallace. From San Bernardino, California, number 20, Richard Abrams. From Camarillo, California, number 11, Greg Goss. From Fort Pierce, Florida, number 29, Joseph Grancelli. From Canoga Park, California, number 48, Jeffrey Kahn. From Lake Forest, California, number 22, Bob Kellenbaum. From Sherman Oaks, California, number 14, Sandy Krigler. 
From Los Angeles, California, number 22, John Neese. From Los Angeles, California, number 27, Sam Neese. From Hicksville, New York, number 44, Marty Perry. From Reseda, California, number 18, Jeff Sherman. From Encino, California, number 14, Phil Snyderman. From Santa Monica, California, number 10, John Stolberg. From Louisville, Texas, number one, Nick Vaughn. And from Newport Beach, California, number one, Paul Von Berg. That's the Bakersfield team. How about a big hand for all the camp teams? And now, introducing the oh, coaches. First, introducing John Davis. He managed at Great Falls this year in his first season as a manager. He was batting coach for the San Antonio Missions in 1990 and for Vero Beach in 1991. He was signed by the Dodgers in the 21st round of June 1980 free agent draft. In 281 over his nine-year minor league career, and played in parts of six seasons at the AAA level, John Davis. <laughs> now introducing Dino Eagle, who was a player coach at Bakersfield in 1992. He's also a player coach for the Vero Beach Dodgers. And Dino Eagle. <laughs> Stay in the bullpen. Now the manager of the Port St. Lucie Dodgers in 1992. He managed the San Antonio Missions team from 1989 to 91. Led the Missions to the Texas Lake Championship Series and also managed the Fruit Beach Dodgers in 1987 and 88. Here's John Schumacher. Now introducing the minor league pitching coordinator for the Dodgers since 1990. He was a roving minor league pitching instructor in 88 and 89. He began his coaching career with the Dodgers in 1981 when he assisted at Vero Beach and also spent the season of 1982 at Vero Beach. Here's Dave Wallace. Now introducing today's trainers, Bill Bueller. He was a head trainer. He's in his 41st year with the Dodger organization. He joined the Dodgers in 1952 as a trainer for the minor leagues. Was appointed the Dodgers assistant in 1957, and in 1960 became the head trainer, Bill Bueller. Also introducing Charlie Strasser, the assistant trainer. He served the Los Angeles Dodgers since 1985. Prior to coming to Los Angeles, he worked as a trainer in the Dodgers minor league system for seven years. He also worked as a trainer for the Cleveland Cavaliers for six years. Charlie Strasser. Now, introducing the Dodger Grapes. It's a man that had a 12-year Major League career, mostly with the Dodgers, appeared in two World Series, posted an 88-68 and 68 record in a 3.79 ERA. He's currently an account executive for National Pension Services in White Plains, New York, and chairman of BAT, the baseball alumni team, which helps me, former players, and their families, Ralph Brega. The next Dodger great pitched 12 seasons in the majors, all with the Dodgers. He ranks 10th on the all-time World Series list for most appearances by a pitcher. He won in double figures six straight seasons, broke the 20-year World Series record when he fanned 14 Yankees in the third game of the 1953 World Series as he won 3-2. He's currently the president of the First National Bank of Madison County, Anderson, Indiana, Carl Erskine. The next Dodger great had 382 home runs and a 273 average in a 16-year Major League career with the Dodgers, Senators, Rangers, and Tigers. He was the National League Rookie of the Year in 1960. He was the first player to hit a ball into the upper deck of Washington's Griffin Stadium and the only player to hit a home run at Dodger Stadium which landed on the lows level. Currently the Major League coach with the New York Yankees, Frank Howard.
Next side to great was bullpen ace for the Dodgers, 1952 to 1957. He also played for the Pirates, Tigers, and Mets. Though primarily reliever, he started 38 regular season games with two shutouts in 1951 and a World Series shutout in 1956. He was 2-2 two two with two saves and 13 World Series appearances. Currently a business development officer for Eastland Bank in Wonsocket, Rhode Island, Clem Levine. makes him the dean of all major league managers for consecutive service with one club. He managed his 2,500th game on August 23rd, 1992. As Dodger manager, has won six division titles, four pennants, and two world championships, has a lifetime winning percentage of 528. Introducing Tom Lasorda. <laughs> Dodger Great played 16 seasons in the majors, 10 with the Dodgers, followed by Oakland, the Chicago Cubs, and Houston, was successful in 83% of his stolen base attempts. Led the National League in stolen bases twice, was a four-time All-Star, had a career 263 average with 155 home runs, while played second base, third base, and the outfield. Currently coached for the Baltimore Orioles, Stevie Rooks. Baseball's finest glove man as he won six straight gold gloves for his effortless play at first base. Had a lifetime fielding average of 995 with just 49 errors in almost 1,500 games. His best season was in 1970 when he hit 319. Has a 789 success rate in stealing bases. Introducing Wes Parker. The next Dodger great pitched 12 seasons in the majors for the Dodgers, Cardinals, and Pirates. With the Dodgers, he held a 724 percentage with 97 wins, 37 losses. He led the National League in winning percentage in 1949 and 1951. Shut out the Yankees 1-0 in the second game of the 49 World Series. Pitched a complete game, defeating the Yankees in the third game of the 52 World Series. Richard Rowe. The next Dodger great appeared in more games than any other Los Angeles Dodger in his 18-year Major League career. Played in three All-Star games and four World Series. Tied the World Series record by collecting one or more hits in each game of the 1978 Fall Classic. And set a series record in 1981 for most assists for a in a 16 series. He managed the Dodgers AAA affiliate, the Albuquerque Dukes in 1992, Bill Russell. Great was a 17-year Major League career. He played with Boston, St. Louis, San Francisco, and the Dodgers from 1976 to 1981. Six-time All-Star, he played in four World Series, three with the Dodgers, including 1981's World Championship team. He recently na was named Minor League Field Coordinator for the Dodgers, Richie Smith. consecutive seasons as a lifetime 295 hitter in 11 World Series home runs and four home runs in the 1953 and 1955 World Series. Life of the Brown and Los Angeles Dodgers, the Mets and the San Francisco Giants, who was elected to the Hall of Fame in 1980. He's currently a Dodger broadcaster for Sports Channel Los Angeles, Dick Snyder. And the next Dodger great played 15 years in the major leagues with the Dodgers and Seattle Mariners, was one of the finest defensive catchers in baseball for 14 years. Played in six league championship series and in four World Series for the Dodgers. Acted in was technical advisor for the movie major league, Steve Yeager. Now introducing a National League umpire, he started umpiring professional baseball at age 18. Youngest umpire ever to umpire professionally. 
In the top of the first with Tom Lasorda on the mound and Roger Merriman at bat, a somewhat wayward pitch after a failed bunt brings a warning from umpire Bruce Freming. The campers have a little fun, but they don't score. Tommy's showing some good hustle, you know, he's got that bad leg. Roger Merriman playing for the San Antonio Club, which won the championship. Merriman hitting just 2-11, 4 for 19. The sort of 0-1 pitch is behind him. Tried to hit him, that's nasty. So, uh, hit him, it hit him. I think he's sending him a message Tommy's trying up, to bun on him. Yeah, he is. Tommy very upset, and Bruce Fremming giving Tommy a warning, don't let that happen again. And, and that's probably never happened during the regular season, uh, Fremming warning of Lasorda. Has never, it? never. No, he doesn't warn him, he just tosses him. One one pitch, he tries to punt again, so he didn't get the message. And Tommy just shakes his head. I think Tommy may abandon the curveball and give him the heat here. In the instructor first, camper Bill Shupper has an outstanding mound appearance, and a single to Davy Lopes is the only hit. At the end of one, there's still no score. Two old pitch, one hopper, past the diving shortstop, and out into left field. Davy hasn't quite gone to first yet. Takes off his helmet and jogs down to first base. What, what you're going to be doing is called chuck and duck. You chuck and you'll be ducking after I swing, but he swings and misses at this one. And Reggie Smith strikes out. And fortunately, the rain lessening just a little bit here. Schuper to Frank Howard, a ground ball to second base. That's going to be an easy play. Up with the ball. In the camper second, Walt Benson, Junior Marquise, and Mike Orioff all get hits off Lasorda as the campers break on top by one to nothing. Frank Howard chugging after it in the corner, and Walter Benson chugging down to second base. He's got himself a stand-up double. I love it. Oh, and to Junior Marquise. There it is. And there's the base hit over a leaping Davis in the left field. Benson's going to stop at third. And the campers keeping the two-out rally alive. Junior Marquise at first, two out, top of the second, no score. The campers trying to get on the board. And there's a ball hit into right center field, base hit. The campers have the lead. Walter Benson scores. It is one to nothing in favor of the campers, and Lasorda is fit to be tied. Two and two to Steven Adler. Two two pitch waved at and missed. So Lasorda gets out of it, but still the campers with a run on three hits. At the end of an inning and a half, the campers won, and the former players nothing. 
Camper Roger Merrim pitching now for San Antonio in the bottom of the second. Can't hold the instructors as they come back to score twice. It's now instructors two, campers one. Could be, could be. 3 0 pitch, that's it in the right field. That'll be a base hit. Wes Parker goes to second, and he's going to stop there as the ball comes back in. So back to back singles. Merrim's 2 0 pitch, a little breaking ball, and he hit it off the fist. A little pop fly, but it's going to drop. Parker's going to score, and the out recorded at first base. So a mistake by the campers as they let that ball fall to the ground. A little indecision on the right side of the infield. Well, Mike Visery. <laughs> There's a one hopper in the right field. So Lasorda with a base hit. Debus is going to go around third. He's going to score, and the Dodger instructors take a two to one lead. The campers get even in the third off Lasorda as Mark Sigmund, Tom Nesvig, and Chris Fabos use base running skills to get a run without a hit. And the score is tied at two apiece. 11 for 16 in the camp, the batter. And he hits a little ground ball up along first. Parker's going to get it and keep it fair. He'll step on the bag, and Sigmund goes down to second base. A runner at second base and one out. Two outs, excuse me. A little ground ball up along third. Devis is going to barehand it, throw wide, and he throws it away. Sigmund should be able to score on that. And it's going to tie things up at two. So John Devis having a tough day. All right. Here you go. In the bottom of the third, pitcher Mike Arieff sits down three good hitters and Bill Russell, Davey Lopes, and Reggie Smith. And the score stands at 2 2. So Junior Marquise with a nice play at shortstop. And at first base, Bill Russell jumped running into King Kong Bundy. And there's another submarine and another pop fly. This one in the right center coming in the right fielder. He one hands it for the out. 2 0 pitch popped up. He got three pop flies. This is trouble. And a nice catch. Henry Cook at third base. The campers have a chance to take the lead in the fourth off a Dodger great Carl Erskine as Barry Scripps gets a single and Larry Kahn's double put two in scoring position before Carl gets the last out. There he goes, a line shot to left center. The runners are running. Here we go. He's going to take three. He's going to third. He's going to third. Oh, a little juggling act in the field. And Larry has himself a stand-up double. There we are. Little grounder at third base. Debo makes a nice play. Throws to first for the third. Oh. The Dodger Grays go ahead by two runs in the fourth as Frank Howard, Steve Yeager, and John Debus all get hits off of Vero Beach pitcher Mark Goldstein and now lead four to two. Ground ball to the right side. Big Sal LaRocca over to Goldstein, and we got Wes out. Big Sal at first, that's right. He takes up a lot of ground. There's a shot by Yeager. It may go. Foul ball. No, the ump says fair. Very close. Here comes Big Frank lumbering around. He scores, and that makes it three to two Dodgers. He hits a nice shot out left center field and deep between the gap. Here comes Jaeger. He'll waltz home. Debus stops it first. Doesn't even try to challenge. He could have made it the second easy, but that does end the inning. So it's four to two at the end of four. Four to two Dodgers. With the campers poised to make a comeback, the skies really opened up in the top of the fifth. After campers Dave Hittner and Dick Marston ground out, Burt Levy and Sal LaRocca both get singles. But they are both stranded by the rain as umpire Bruce Freming says it's too wet to play anymore. The final score, instructors four, campers two. The Camp Awards Banquet is coming up next. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. He makes the turn and holds. Line single to left for Burt Levy. Sal bangs the ground ball to third. Through Devis' legs. Sal, bad leg, gets down to first base. Charitably ruled that a base hit. It did take a bad hop. It didn't. And Bruce Fremming looks like he called the game. I'm not so certain. Looks like Bruce has called the game. And it's four to two. The Dodgers. Well, actually, you got to go five. But I think it's. Today's game has been called because of rain. Oh, thank you for attending. So it would have to be made up, I guess, next February and then next November for those of us who are back then. Actually, there's no game in the books. Four to two.
that we will see again, whether it's in February or next November, that you'll all come back and have a little visit here at old Dodger Town. We'll be waiting for you. Good night, everybody.